So section 2.1 is transformations of quadratic functions, and this section should seem kind of similar to some sections from chapter 1, where we're doing different transformations on just parent functions in general. The same rules apply here. So quadratic function is a function that can be written in the form f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k, and where a can't be 0 because that would get rid of this whole section that has the x squared. Quadratic is just really anything that has x to the second power. So the U-shaped graph of a quadratic function, function is called a parabola, and you can graph a quadratic function by applying transformation to the graph of the parent function, which is f of x equals just x squared. So we're going to start with just translations. So horizontal translations or vertical translations, uh, they work and they're written the same exact way as they were for absolute value functions, um, linear functions, a little bit even closer to absolute value functions, I would say, because you already kind of have that, uh, some sort of like bracket, I guess for lack of better terms, embedded in the equation there, typically. Um, with absolute value, it's obviously absolute value bars. Now with quadratic, it's just parentheses. So if we want to translate something left or right, we need to take a value away from the input. So that value we call is, or we call it our h value. Um, and you'll notice that when we write it in function notation, so f of x minus h, there's already a negative embedded in there. So, and that becomes x minus h squared. It's already a negative embedded in there, so that's just one thing you kind of have to keep track on as we go through the chapter. Um, when h is a negative number, when h is less than zero, the graph shifts in the negative direction, so it goes left. When uh, h is greater than zero or positive, the graph shifts in the positive direction, so it is um, shifting right. So one thing to keep in mind though, since I have a negative in here already, if h is negative, this is actually going to turn into x plus a number. When h is positive, this will be stay x minus that number, because that double negative, the subtraction in the negative will make it into a plus. And then for vertical translations, um, we're just adding this constant after our our function in general, but um, it's really just changing the output, like the original output of the function is by adding this constant after, whereas on when we're taking h away from x, we're kind of changing the input. Um, so for a vertical translation in function notation, it's f of x plus k, and then that equals x squared plus k. So this plus k is telling us what our vertical translation is, and you'll notice this is just a plus, so we don't have to worry about trying to remember to flip the sign or anything like that. Um, if k is negative or less than zero, the graph is going to shift down, and if k is positive or greater than zero, the graph is going to shift up. So these pictures are in your textbook. If you want to look more closely at them, you are welcome to. So example one is translations of a quadratic function. So it says describe the transformation of f of x equals x squared, represented by g of x equals x plus 4 squared minus 1, and then graph each function. So just by looking at our g of x, we should, we might already be able to like possibly recognize the translations that are there. So in the parentheses, I have x plus 4. And we know that when we're looking at in the parentheses, like what's being done to the x value, that's telling us our horizontal translation. But since I have an x plus 4 in the parentheses, my h value is actually going to be negative 4. And that just goes back to... Um, when we're looking at function notation, it's uh, x minus h and then squared. So if I'm having an x plus 4 in here, that's really because it's x minus negative 4. That's what creates that plus. And then after my x plus 4 squared, I have a minus 1. So that's telling me that my k value is negative 1. So because I have an h and a k, I have both a horizontal and a vertical translation. So we'll say that g of x has been translated It's been translated left 4 because the h value is negative 4 and down 1 because the k value is negative 1. So g of x has been translated left 4 and down 1, and we can graph it that way. So we can graph it just with translations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a quick table for the parent function, um, just so we can kind of get a refresher on what that looks like. 
So I have x and I have f of x, which is my parent function x squared. So for my parent function on my table, I'm just going to use the, ta the values or the input values, negative 1, sorry, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Um, and then I'm going to substitute each of those into my parent function, which is x squared. So when I take negative 2 and I square it, I get positive 4. When I take negative 1 and I square it, I get positive 1. When I take 0, square it, I get 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. So these give me five clean, nice points to graph my parent function. So I'm going to do that in green. So it's a little lighter. So I have negative 2, 4. So I'll go left 2, up 4. Um, negative 1, 1. Go left 1, up 1. 0, 0. Uh, 1, 1, right 1, up 1, and then 2, 4, so right 2, up 4. And you should see that there is symmetry um, over the vertex for a quadratic function, just like there was with absolute value. Um, sometimes it's tempting to kind of like make quadratic functions look almost like absolute value graphs, where it's like more of a pointed V shape, but it should be a nice smooth U shape. So there's my parent function, there's my f of x, and then I need to graph my translation now, or sorry, my transform function, and I can do so just by translating each of my original points. So I know that g of x has been translated left 4 and down 1. That means I could take each of my points and I could translate them left 4 down 1. Um, or you can kind of like pay attention to the relationship between the points, and what I mean by that is like if I'm looking at the vertex, um, I have another point, just like up one, right one, and then up one, left one, and you can use those type of relationships to graph your other points if you would like to. So um, I'm going to start just by the vertex. So if I'm translating left four down one, I just need to count that off. Um, so I'm going one, two, three, four, down one, so I'm at the point negative four, negative one. And then, again, you can count each of these off. So 1, 2, 3, 4, down 1. So negative 3, 0. Um, I have another point that reflects over the axis of symmetry. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'll count out this point. So left 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, down 1. And then I'll count off this point. 1, 2, 3, 4, down 1. And then once you have those five points, you can go ahead and connect them. And that is your g of x. So you can see that between f of x and g of x, the shape or like the width or anything, the orientation of the graph hasn't really been changed at all. It's just been moved over. So that's where the translation comes in. It just uh, changes the location of the graph. Okay, so next we're going to kind of talk about just reflections, horizontal stretch, and shrinks, and stuff like that. Again, this picture is also in your textbook, so it's there for you if you need it. So reflections in the x-axis. Um, sorry, a lot of these equal signs look like negatives, but I promise they're equal signs. There are some negatives, though. Um, with reflections in the x-axis, you have to negate the output. So that usually looks like a negative out in front of, say, the absolute value bars or out in front of the uh, x squared, depending on what type of function it is. So if I want to reflect in the x-axis, that means reflect over the x-axis, same kind of idea. I need to take what was originally just positive x squared and that becomes negative x squared. That takes all of the original output values and just flips the sign. So that's why it flips it from um, the first and second quadrants to the third and fourth. And then for reflections in the x-axis, or sorry, y-axis, you have to negate the input. So instead of it just being positive x squared, um, we're going to take the input itself and negate it. So it'll be negative x in parentheses squared. Um, and you'll notice like a lot of times that doesn't really impact graphs much, like for quadratics or absolute value graphs, because the reflection doesn't change itself. Like if I were to take this, I could reflect it over the y-axis as many times as I wanted, and it wouldn't really change. Where it changes is if you have um, like horizontal translations and stuff like that. So for horizontal stretches and shrinks, we're actually not going to 
deal with them that much. We focus more on vertical stretches and strings. But when you have a horizontal stretch and shrink, you actually have the A value multiplied by your input. So instead of f of x equals x squared, it would become in parentheses ax, then that is squared. Like I said, we don't really focus them on them much in this class. You may see, see a couple like homework problems, um, but that's pretty much it. What we will focus on is vertical stretch and shrinks. And when we have a vertical stretch and shrink, say we start with f of x equals x squared, we are going to basically multiply our output by that a value that's going to stretch or shrink it. So like we'll input a value for x, square it, and then multiply it by a, and that's what will stretch or shrink it. So if the a value is greater than one, it will be a stretch, and if the a value is between zero and one, so think a fraction like one half, or if you see a decimal for whatever reason, that would be a vertical shrink. When you have a negative number, um, that's why it's not necessarily like a is greater than one, a is less than one. It's just uh, we're looking at just like the positive value. When we get in, when we start getting into negatives, that's um, a reflection. So for example two, it says transformations of quadratic functions, and then it says describe the transformation of f of x equals x squared, represented by g, and then graph each function. So for 2a, we have g of x equals negative one-half x squared. So we have a couple of different transformations here. So the first transformation that we see if we're just looking at left to right is we have this negative out in front. So when we have a negative out in front, um, that just ends up impacting the like output of the function. It doesn't really impact the input necessarily because I could put whatever value in here for x that I want and square it. And then what the change is going to happen is after I evaluate it, that number will become its opposite sign. So if it was positive, it'll become negative, vice versa. So that negative out in front is a reflection in the x-axis. And this is kind of like what we talked about up here on this top left picture. Anytime we have, say we started with x squared, if I have that negative sign out in front there, that's where it becomes a reflection in the x-axis, or it gets flipped over the x-axis, basically. And then the second thing that we have to consider is we have this one half out in front of the x-squared. We basically have a coefficient on the x-squared. And so that means that we have either a vertical stretch or a shrink. So since this value, since it's a one half, we have a vertical shrink. So because that value is between zero and one, we have a vertical shrink by a scale factor of one half. So vertical shrink by a scale factor of one half. I'm going to kind of show you, I guess, the reflections in two different steps just so we can work through it slowly. Um, I'm going to start by graphing the parent function though. So again, the parent function we just graphed on the other page. We had a point at 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and then negative 1, 1, negative 2, 4. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect it. Um, and I'll just kind of draw little x's where my reflection points are. So anytime something gets reflected over the x-axis, um, we really just have to kind of pay attention to, I guess, the distance it was from the x-axis originally. So 0, 0 is on the x-axis, so it stays there. Um, 1, 1 goes from well, 1, 1 to 1, negative 1. It just gets flipped over the x-axis. 2, 4 goes from 2, positive 4 to 2, negative 4. So each of my y values are basically just getting the opposite sign that they had originally. And then one, negative 1, 1 becomes negative 1, negative 1, and then negative 2, 4 becomes negative 2, positive 4. So that was my reflection, and now I'm going to do my vertical shrink. So vertical shrink is going to be taking the vert vertical shrink or stretch is going to be taking the y coordinate of each of your points and multiplying it by that scale factor. So um, I have a point at 0, 0. So if I take my y value of 0, multiply it by 1 half, that stays the same. And then I have a point at 1, negative 1. So if I multiply that y coordinate, uh, negative 1, 
by one half, that becomes a negative one half. So this point goes from one negative one to one negative one half, just do your best to graph it as accurately as possible. Uh, the point two, negative four, if I multiply that negative four by one half, that becomes negative two. So this point goes from two negative four to two negative two. Negative one, negative one, uh, if I multiply that negative one by one half, it becomes negative one, negative one half, and then negative two, negative four. Again, if I multiply that negative four by one half, that point becomes negative two, negative two. So, and you can kind of see like this graph is getting kind of smushed like we talked about before down towards the x-axis. Um, you could see like it starts to become a little wider. That's kind of an indicator of a vertical shrink. Yeah, for with a vertical stretch or shrink, we're just kind of manipulating the x or sorry, the y value of each point without changing the x value of each point. So for example, b, um, it's g of x equals in parentheses 2x squared plus 1. So what's kind of cool about this one is it looks like it's a horizontal stretch or shrink, but you don't necessarily have to graph it that way. And it's probably easier not to. It's probably easier to graph it like a vertical stretch and shrink. So um, I can just kind of like simplify this equation. So g of x equals, so 2x in parentheses squared, that's like 2 squared times x squared. So I can rewrite that as 4x squared plus 1. And then now I can just approach it like it's a vertical stretch in a translation. So remember that when you're looking at transformations, you have to make sure you pay attention to order of operations. So um, I am going to stretch this first and translate it up one after. And sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. So since I have this coefficient of 4 in front of the x squared, that's telling me that there's a vertical stretch by 4. So vertical stretch by a factor of four, and then I'm adding this constant, this just regular old number, after. So when I'm adding that constant after, that means, okay, so I'll plug in whatever input I want, um, evaluate this, and then shift everything up one. So this is gonna change my y value of whatever the point would have been originally. So that plus one tells me that my graph is gonna be translated up one. So again, I'm going to start by graphing my parent function. Um, so 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, negative 1, 1, and negative 2, 4. And then I'm going to do the same thing as last time where I showed it in both steps. So if I want to do a vertical stretch by a factor of 4, I'm going to, I'll start with my vertex. So 0, 0, if I multiply my y value by 0, or zero by four, it's still zero. Um, the point one, one, if I multiply my y value by four, that becomes one, four. If I look at my point negative one, one, if I multiply my y value by four, that becomes negative one, four. If I try to do my point two, four, and I multiply the y, y, the y value by four, I get um, 16, and that's not on my graph. I don't really ever expect you to graph something up to 16, so if you get to a value, I would say like past 10 is safe to skip that point. So we're actually just going to leave it like this um, and then we can do our translation and finish our graph. So now I just have to translate each of my points up one. So with uh, these three points, this is my vertical stretch by a scale factor of four. Again, it, translating or sorry, stretching these points by a scale factor of four would just be way up here. So you can skip that. Um, if I go ahead and translate this, 0, 0 turns into 0, 1. I'm just shifting it up 1. 1, 4 becomes 1, 5, just shifting it up 1. And then negative 1, 4 becomes negative 1, 5, just shifting it up 1. And then you can connect those points. And I, again, I know it's really tempting to draw it like a V, but do your best to kind of keep that U shape. Even if it is more narrow, that's okay. I'm not that good at drawing them either. As long as you're getting your points, you're good. Okay, so now we can kind of see this graph has been 
stretch so it's kind of become more narrow it's getting pulled away from the x-axis and it has also been shifted up one so next section is writing transformations of quadratic functions which i really like so um we've said i've mentioned vertex a few times um today and with absolute value so the lowest point of a parabola that opens up or the highest point of a parabola that opens down, it's called the vertex. And there's something with quadratics, it's called vertex form. Um, and that's f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k, where a can't be zero again because then the x squared goes away. And the vertex is hk. So that's really important to remember that the vertex is hk and that'll help you graph these and also write functions. So example three is writing a transform quadratic function. It says, let the graph of G be a vertical stretch by a, scale, bar, by a factor of two and a reflection in the x-axis, followed by a translation three units down of the graph of f of x equals x squared. Write a rule for G and identify the vertex. So first I'm gonna go through and just kind of like pick out all of our different transformations. So it says that the graph of G is gonna be a vertical stretch by a factor of two. It's also gonna be a reflection in the x-axis. It's also gonna have a translation three units down. So up above in this graphic, we've talked about this a few times. Um, this A value we know is a indicating a stretch or a shrink, but if there's a negative out in front here, that's just telling us that there's a reflection also. And then this h value indicates a horizontal translation. We've talked about that. And the k value tells us that there's a vertical translation. So knowing all those variables will help you like write the transform function much more quickly if you can get comfortable with those. So um, the fact that, so it tells us it's a vertical stretch by a scale factor of two in a reflection in the x-axis. So between both of those, that means that we can figure out what the a value is. So since it's a vertical stretch by a scale factor of 2, a would be 2, but because there's also a reflection in the x-axis, a would be negative 2. So if a is negative, there's that reflection in the x-axis, and then the actual, like, I guess the absolute value of this indicates how much stretch or how much shrink there is. And then it says followed by a translation 3 units down. So since we have a translation 3 units down, that means that k would be negative 3, because k tells us our translation, or sorry, our vertical translation. And then we want to write a row for g and identify the vertex. So I'm going to just start by rewriting this vertex form. Um, and then we'll kind of just start plugging in or substituting in our a and k values. So we'll say g of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. And then we figured out from this problem that a equals negative 2. So I'm going to substitute that in. They didn't tell us in the problem that there was any like h value or there was any horizontal translation or anything like that. So I'm just going to use h equals zero. So x minus zero squared. And then I have my plus k. So I'm going to do plus negative three. And we'll simplify this too. So if I want to simplify this, I'm, g of x equals that negative two. There's nothing I can simplify there. Um, x minus 0 squared, I could just leave as, or I could change to x squared, and then plus negative 3 would just be minus 3. So as we're getting comfortable with vertex form, um, it might be hard if you skipped from, say you skip from here to here, it might be kind of difficult to identify the vertex because the vertex we know is hk we talked about up here. Um, and when we use vertex form and we plug them or substitute them in individually, it really helps us see what the vertex is. So the vertex is the point h, k. So h is zero and k is negative three. And like I said, that's just really clear to see with this step. So it's really worth it just to do that one extra line. So we wrote the rule for g and now we just have to state the vertex. So the vertex is h, k, so zero, negative three.
for example four, so another writing on transform quadratic function, it says let g or let the graph of g be a translation three units right and two units up followed by a reflection in the y-axis of the graph of f of x equals x squared minus 5x, and we want to write a rule for g. So first, it's always helpful to kind of like underline or just like point out what our transformations are. So we have a translation three units right and two units up, and then a reflection in the y-axis. So um, when it says like followed by, when it gives one set of translation or one set of transformations and then followed by another one, that's kind of like a keyword that you may have to do it in two different steps to make sure that the order is done correctly. So I'm just going to do the translations first. So I'm going to call this like middle function h of x. So this is not my final one, which would be g of x. This is just like my in between. This is the one with just the translations. So h of x is going to be f of x, but translated 3 right and 2 up. And how we write that in function notation would be f of, and then if I'm translating 3 units right, that would be x minus 3. And if I'm translating 2 units up, that would be plus 2. So now I just need to take these transformations and apply them to f of x. So f of x minus 3... That means wherever you see an x, you replace it with x minus 3, even if there's multiple x's. So x squared would become x minus 3 squared, and then minus 5x, that would become minus 5 times x minus 3. So anywhere in the function you see an x, it gets changed to an x minus 3. And then plus 2 would be my vertical translation. So again, just h of x, this is just the translations, and then in, once we simplify this, we will do our reflection. So I have x minus 3 squared, and it would be really cool if this would just turn into x squared minus 9, but it doesn't. Um, you'll probably remember that from Algebra 1, that this actually means x minus 3 times x minus 3, and we will have to FOIL that. So x minus 3 squared, we can't just do a shortcut and like, I don't know, distribute that squared in, it's not the same thing. You have to write out the whole thing side by side and FOIL it. Um, and then for the negative 5 or minus 5 times x minus 3, I can distribute that. So negative 5 times x turns into negative 5x or minus 5x. And then that negative has to get distributed again. So negative 5 times negative 3 turns into positive 15 and then plus 2. So now um, you probably see why there's this little reminder here. So remember FOIL, it stands for first, outer, inner, last, and that means that you take the first uh, terms in each binomial or each parentheses, multiply them, the outside two terms in each parentheses, and multiply them, the inner two terms, and then the last two terms. So for first, I'm going to multiply x times x, so that is x squared. For outer, I'll multiply that x by that negative 3, so negative 3x. For inner, I'm going to multiply negative 3 by x, so another negative 3x. And then for last, I'm going to multiply negative 3 times negative 3, which is positive 9. And then I'm going to bring down my negative 5x, and then I'll go ahead and combine uh, 15 and 2, so that's 17. So now I can start combining like terms here. So x squared, I only have that one that's that kind of term is just the x squared but I can combine the negative 3x, the negative 3x, and the negative 5x into an, a, negative, a negative 11x. So negative 3 and negative 3 is negative 6. Another negative 5 brings me to negative 11x. And then I have my 9 and 17. So together those are 26. So h of x, or aka like f of x, just with the translation 3 right, 2 up, would be x squared minus 11x plus 26. So I just did the first half there. Now I still need to do my reflection in the y-axis. So um, in order to get to my reflection in the y-axis, I have to take my h of x and I have to negate the input. So g of x, or like my final function that has both transformations, is going to be equal to h of negative x because this is how I reflect in the y-axis. I have to take the input and negate it before I evaluate the function there. So this is my reflection. So that means if you look at h of x, wherever you see an x, it turns into negative x. 
So if regardless of how many x's they are, they all turn into negative x. So x squared would turn into negative x squared. And then minus 11 times x, so that would turn into minus 11 times negative x. And then plus 26. And then negative x squared is just negative, it's like negative x times negative x, which a negative times negative turns into positive. So negative x in parentheses squared is the same thing as just x squared. And then for negative 11 times negative x, that is positive 11x, because I have a negative times a, a negative. And then I have plus 26, and that doesn't change because I don't have that uh, x value there. So g of x, or my final function that has both the translations and the reflection, is going to be g of x equals x squared plus 11x plus 26. And then last example, um, go ahead and pause here and kind of take a chance to read through the example before I start talking through it. So example five, it says the height h in feet of water spraying from a fire hose can be modeled by h of x equals negative 0.03 x squared plus x plus 25, where x is the horizontal distance in feet from the fire truck. The crew raises the ladder so that the water hits the ground 10 feet further from the fire truck. Write a function that models the new path of the water. So a couple of things we need to just kind of like identify just from looking at the graph. It'll just make it a lot easier for us. So looking at our function, the fire hose originally hit 50 feet away. So it started here, you can kind of picture like the little fire truck and the hose is shot from what, 25 feet above the ground. And you can see just by the trajectory of the water that it originally hits 50 feet away. So it originally hits 50 feet away and we want it to uh, land 10 feet away or 10 feet further, sorry. So we want it to land at 60 feet instead of 50 feet. Okay, so we want to increase that or we want to bump that up by 10 feet to hit at 60 feet. So the first thing that we have to do is we have Okay, so this is the last example, um, and I want you to go ahead and pause it so you can read through before we actually start the problem and kind of get an idea of what the problem is asking you. So example five says the height h in feet of water spraying from a fire hose can be modeled by h of x equals negative 0.03x squared plus x plus 25, where x is the horizontal distance in feet from the fire truck. The crew raises the ladder so that the water hits the ground 10 feet further from the fire truck write a function that models the new path of the water. So this part in the middle, um, so the crew raises the ladder so that it hits the ground 10 feet further. Them raising the ladder is, it's not gonna like change the trajectory, they're like physically raising the ladder higher. So that's telling us that there's gonna be some sort of vertical translation, we just don't know how far. All we really know as far as what's changing is that it's going from landing 50 feet away right here to landing 60 feet away. So this is the new landing part right here. And we have to figure out how far up they move the graph and or really the ladder um, in order to make the water hit here. So again, the trajectory is not changing. The angle is not changing. Just the whole graph is literally shifting up. So in order to figure out how far it's being translated or raised up, we have to figure out what this distance is. So we need to figure out how what the function is at when x equals 60, because that'll tell us the y value here. That'll basically tell us this point 
when x equals 60 and that'll give us information that we need to know in order to figure out how far up we need to translate. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the function at x equals 60 in order to figure out what the y value is down at this point. So h of 60 and anytime you want to find like say what the value is at a certain function you just evaluate for that x value. So like say I wanted to find I don't know like the height when at x equals 20 I would just plug in x equals 20 it would give me this point. But I want to find this height down here so that I know how far up I have to shift my graph. So I'm going to evaluate h of 60 and that just means I have to plug in x equals 60 into the function that they give me. So negative 0 0.03 times 60 squared and then plus 60 for plus x and then plus 25. So I have negative uh, 0 0.03 times 60 squared. So times 60 squared is 3,600. And then plus 60 plus 25. If I take that 3,600 and then multiply it by 0 0.03 or negative 0 0.03, I get negative 108 plus 60 plus 25. So if I add negative 108 to 60 and then I also add 25, I end up with negative 23. So what that's saying is basically this point right here is the point 60, negative 23. So if we're going to shift this graph up so that the water first hits the ground at 60 feet instead of at 50 feet, I have to shift this graph up 23 feet because it's at negative 23 right now. So I need to translate up 23. So I'm going to call my new function g of x. So g of x is going to be my original function, which was h of x that they gave us in the problem. h of x is going to be translated up 23 to get my new function. So h of x plus 23, right? Because I just have to add that value after the function in order to translate it upward. So that just means I'm going to take h of x. So the original one that they gave me, negative 0.03x squared plus x plus 25 and then I need to add 23 to that. So fortunately there's really not much to simplify other than adding the 25 and the 23. So g of x equals negative 0.03x squared plus x plus 25 plus 23 which is 48 altogether. So the new function that will allow the water to hit the ground at 60 feet is going to be g of x equals negative 0.3x squared plus x plus 48. And that just is this graph shifted up 23 feet.